first I'm going to go with um, minimal disturbance. Uh, as far as equipment goes, we run an 1890 air seeder, a uh, single disc, pretty common. And uh, just for planter, we run 1770 uh, no till planter. Uh, the equipment works good, but I'd be lying if I say it isn't extremely challenging at times. Um, with the journey we've been down the last eight years. Um, we've learned a lot, we've made a lot of mistakes, and we keep getting better every year. Uh, some of the issues, the residue, uh, wet soils, <coughs> compactions, um, but we've uh, learned to deal with it, and as we get further into soil health, uh, a lot of these issues seem to be resolving, and we can work through them. Uh, one thing I was going to say about uh, planting with the air seeder and stuff, it, it's a nice firm seedbed um, and there's lots of structure there in a no-till system so you can get your tractors, your equipment, it floats better, you know, as soon as you start destroying the structure of the soil, that's when you start getting stuck and having grease out and stuff like that, um, drying the soil out, you get big hard clumps. My dad always talked about how he used to farm. He'd go try and take the drill in there and all he had was just a bunch of hard chunks and uh, he's just amazed at what we can do today. So, um, one thing I want to touch on and probably not super proud of, but we uh, own one of these fancy machines called a Coulter. Uh, they're pretty popular nowadays. Um, we have been using it on fire CRP, so instead of our no-till wishing disc, and uh, it has been working fairly good. Uh, I, so I like the Coulter for that. We don't have we can smooth out those CRP fields um, without doing extensive tillage and get them back into production. And then uh, what I did do, which I feel was a pretty big mistake with the coulter is we thought we could incorporate some urea on some no-till fields and we left the coulter at a straight angle and went ahead and spread the urea, coultered the field, thought we were doing pretty good, it didn't seem like we were disturbing any soil, um, but then all of a sudden the big wind come. Well guess where our residue ended up? In the neighbor's field. We uh, de-anchored the residue and by doing that, you know, it, it doesn't feel like you're doing any tillage, but when you unanchor that residue, you're, you're really destroying more than, more than you realize. So. Next, I'm going to go to surface residue to armor. <coughs> it protects our soil from erosion, whether it be winds or, or big heavy rains. You know, we keep that residue on the surface, it, it helps a lot. Um, like I said before, the residues, the armor is anchored there, it doesn't, it shouldn't move, you know, it should stay there and let the biology mineralize it and turn it into nutrients for the preceding crops and keep a, well, and protect the biology because biology is underneath that armor if we start removing that, it's like taking the roof off your house. You, you expose them to, to things that they, they can't survive in. And so we try not to remove any uh, residue. We uh, would rather buy straw from a neighbor than, than uh, remove residue for, for our own operation. And like Gabe said, I guess you can take the cattle where they need to go. So it's obviously it's too And then we go with crop diversity, um, my rotations, I have no set rotation, uh, I just keep mixing it up, keep mother nature on our toes. Um, in the last five years, we've had ten different species of cash crops and uh, seven different species of cover crops. 
and the more diverse we can make it, and the more we can mimic um, Mother Nature, the better off we'll be. The happier our biology is, the more diverse it is, the happier our biology is, the happier our plants will be. It keeps our insect communities in balance, it keeps the weed communities in check, and all of these things in the future are going to extend into a profitable farm. next slide uh, I put on there. Uh, alfalfa has been something that we've integrated into our crop rotation and uh, I've been really pleased with it. It feels like it's taking our, our cropping rotation to the next level in, in some regards. Um, it increases soil aggregation and uh, water filtration and also it's perennial, which we don't get on our other cropping systems, so there's always a live rut out there, so I feel it's increasing the biology. Um, and then it gives it, also gives it a break from uh, pesticides, which I think is a big plus in um, keeping the biology growing and, and getting the soil to be more active and minimizing more nutrients. Uh, alfalfa also gives us another opportunity to integrate a cover crop when we rotate it out, which is every four to six years is what we've kind of been doing, but we're maybe going to get shorter and shorter and try and run it too faster. But anyways, after we uh, get the uh, alfalfa sprayed and we hay it, and then we got pretty good time left before our freeze up to get some good growth on a cover crop, so it kind of gives us a window in there, which has been a nice other, or another nice benefit of a bell crop. As far as cover crops go, uh, we've been trying to find windows for cover crops, like there's a lot of people in this room I've been trying to do. Um, one that we did the last few years is prevent plant ground that one really seems to work good. You get in there after it dries out a little later, you get some deep rooted crops to grow in there and, and use up some of that moisture instead of going in there and doing a bunch of tillage, which is just gonna create a compaction layer, which in return is gonna just keep it wet. So if you can get in there later on, you know, get get some deep roots in there, I think it's gonna be better off. So, um, and then if in expiring CRP, we have done that before too, uh, plant a cover crop after the CRP expires in the fall. Um, and then also after early seeded crops, or early harvested I should say, peas and winter wheat and barley are some of the things that we've put cover crops in after. So, and that's, it's tough to get much growth on our short growing season up here, but but it's more important about for the biology, you know, to have something to live on, that, that live plant out there. Okay. So now I'm going to focus on one field in particular. Uh, this is a hay field, one of the first alfalfa fields we put in, and it's just starting to come out now. Um, it was in from 2006 to 2012. Uh, we did the chemical burn down and then we hate it and then we see it the cover crop June 22nd and then 2013 which was this year we had corn on there and next year we're not sure yet. That was the cover crop mixture <laughs> that we planted um, after we had hated and sprayed it. We had a, I think slide back. This slide there is actually, that's the actual field that, um, that we have after the hay crop, and that was, I guess, September 6th, so it was fairly dry. That was in some low ground, and we had pretty significant growth where we had moisture. So then uh, this is some of Dr. Haney's data that we had on that field. Uh, 
so May of this year, or 2013, he had the total biology of 1289, which was rated slightly below average, and the food was 276, which I think is kind of average according to what Dave's saying. And then what our soil test would have showed, the inorganic was 43 pounds, and the organic N was 44. And I'm not exactly sure. The total N was 87 pounds, but I'm not exactly sure what uh, percentage he was giving of the organic N in that particular field. But, and then we had a corn crop on there, and uh, then Jay come out with an ax on November and tried to get another sample. He had to work pretty hard. The uh, weight of the biology at the end of the year was almost, well, it was over double, I guess, 3,216, so it increased significantly, and, the, and it makes sense because the food had went up so much also. So it's like a city with food or a city without food. Um, and then the total N uh, on that one was 106, but I'm not sure on the organic portion how much I was receiving out of that either. But. So, well, I guess Jay had, I guess we do have it figured out at the end here. Fall of 2013 test results, it's 106 pounds, and then the total crop available <coughs> nitrogen for the next year was 54 pounds. So there's a portion of the of the organic end that I was getting off that field. So a pretty good pretty good bank going into the, the next season with the 77 pounds in organic end. So. Next, I'm going to switch over to um, partnerships. Um, a few years ago, me and my dad have always farmed together and. Uh, and then a few years ago, we partnered up with a neighbor, uh, Ron Hine. And uh, in the picture, you can see I, I'm, I'm the farmer. My dad's the businessman. Ron Hine's the grazer. And Jay was just in the slide, so I had to call him a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jay. He kind of helps us on our journey. You know, but, uh, my dad, uh, you know, we kind of call him the businessman. He's, he, uh, not super into the, the grass and he's not super into the the farming but you know he, he's he's got a good good way of creating relationships business relationships and and getting and doing a good job of business and Ron is extremely intelligent in grass and understands the cattle and, and is willing to put the time into uh, to keep our cattle moving and and, and we partnered them together as a one cow herd, and then we run yearlings as a as a one herd also. And Ronnie manages all of that, and it takes a lot of stress off of us. And we can concentrate on what we're good at. And you know, so I enjoy farming. I've always enjoyed farming, and it's what I love to do. So it's not like going to work. And that's what I can really focus on. And so this partnership has really brought the best out of all of us. And it's, and it's made the best um, use out of our resources that we have there. So, and then this next slide, I'll talk a little bit about livestock integration into the cropland. Uh, about five years ago, I would have said I absolutely hate cattle. It's because I, I really truly did. I hated them with a passion and I wasn't afraid to tell people. Um, but in this last few years, I've realized how important they are. Um, and as we make this journey, it, it's more and more evident that getting the cattle back to the, to the cropland is so important for, for the system. I mean, that. They just need to be out there, and so any chance we get, we try and integrate them into the cropland. Uh, it's not always easy, but you've got to kind of think outside the box to, to make it happen and, and plan accordingly, and everyone tries to communicate with each other in the partnership to, to make it happen. And uh, so, uh, 
observations I've made over the years. Well, not over the years, I guess, but just in the last year. Um, that field that I was focused on earlier, I um, did kind of just my mock trial. I didn't have any of Dr. Haney's data before I planted, but I put like 20 pounds of nitrogen down and all in that field, assuming I had a pretty good nitrogen bank with having a pill and a cover crop. And uh, when the data come back, back at the other slide, the total in for in the spring said 87 pounds, and our corn field this year there was 20 pounds of additional fertilizer made 87 bushels. The correlations there are very seem to be very close. So, and then I also I had a full fertility strip in that field that I fertilized fall before, and um, when we combine, and this is no scientific stuff, you know. I just thought if I'm spending a hundred bucks an acre was what the fertilizer was costing, you know, I better be seeing huge results. And boy, I. I couldn't tell a thing, you know, and it's hard to tell five, ten bushel on a yield monitor sometimes, but but there was really no significant difference. So I think we really got to start paying attention to how much fertilizer we're throwing at this stuff and really what, what we're getting paid for. So. And then the one other thing I did this year is I went to no insecticide. Um, we used to throw it in the tank quite often just because. And I know now is fairly stupid, and you know we need to pay attention because we're killing so many good creatures that you know we got to give give the system a chance to work. Just because there's a bug out there, there's a hole in my leaf, I'm not, I shouldn't go kill kill the world, you know. So, anyways, those are some observations, and thanks for listening to me today.